Good morning, Faith Centennial United Church! Good morning. Oh, I love it. Fantastic. Last week we had a little technical glip there and uh, we didn't catch the good morning. Everyone missed it but us here. Uh, so I'm glad we didn't get it. We got, we're on this morning. We got sound, so we're good. Uh, so they hear you this morning. Welcome to you online as well to Faith Centennial United Church where Jesus Christ is Lord. Can you believe March is almost done? Uh, so <laughs> thank goodness. Oh, there's, a, there's an interesting, people are like, oh, it's going so fast, right? Yeah, the year's almost over, right? Like we're, we're a third of the way through, so it's almost over. Yeah, no, sort of. It's just flying by. Just a couple short weeks, we'll be in Holy Week, right? And then Palm Sunday and Good Friday and Easter. And then it's looking forward to May, right? <laughs> and May 2 4, right? Like we're getting on, right? Yeah, I know, boo, right? <laughs> uh, well, uh, it's. Uh, I do want to say uh, Linda Salt, for those of you who know her, uh, bids you a warm welcome uh, and a hello. She hopes you're all well, and she's got us in prayer. Uh, so if you know her, and, uh, and you might actually see her a little bit later on this year, uh, coming to fill in for me, I do believe. Uh, so uh, she says hello, and if you don't know who she is, you'll see her coming through anyway. Yeah, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Oh, man, I tell you, just those days can just go. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> we're going to do a responsive psalm this morning, Psalm 32. Uh, if you're looking in the Pew Bible, it's on page 549. Uh, if not, you can see it on your screens, just with the call to worship. Five parts in white, your parts in yellow, and we'll say it responsively. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Amen. <clears throat> Our next reading is from Joshua chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. Uh, and I don't have the page number because I left my thing back down there. Okay, that's all right. 1211. 1211? For Joshua? 211. 211. 211. Uh, verses five, uh, 9 through 12. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread, and roasted grain. The manna stopped from that day after. They ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year they ate the produce of Canaan. And from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32, that's on 1211, isn't it? 1035, 1035 in your pew Bibles. Luke 15, 11 to 32. The parable of the lost son. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in, the, in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. 
So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He no longer, he longed, sorry, to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to, his fa- said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father quickly said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. They be, so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when his son, when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the living word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us come together in prayer. Mighty God, we thank you for your holy scriptures. We do not know what we would do without them. They are a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. And when we forget them, we forget you. O God, this is your revelation of who you are of your directives to your church and your people. It behooves us to study them, to dig deep and to find out what you are saying to us. So help us today, O God. We want to hear the Holy Spirit. We are trusting, we are praying in the Spirit, and we ask in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would illumine these pages, that it fill the words of the preacher and the listener alike, and that we may know that today we have met with the living God. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The last few weeks have been difficult to watch as we have journeyed with Jesus. They have been difficult if you have been keeping up or keeping an eye on the news at night as well as tensions with Russia continue to rise. If anything, we might draw some inspiration, some strength for our own Lenten practices Lent is a time of sacrifice, after all, where we give something up for 40 days to practice discipline and solidarity with Christ during his most painful few hours. Christ certainly gave up much in his short walk to Calvary. Normally, this isn't a long or grueling trip, but with a 300-pound cross and already being beaten and tortured before along the way, the trip becomes more difficult. And yet, on this road, Jesus falls a third time his body faltering under the weight of all that is going on, under the weight of the massive cross he must drag through the streets. It is a wondering of mine, and perhaps of yours as well, as to why Jesus would even acquiesce to this demand. In our modern sensibilities, we might claim the right to nonviolent resistance. We would simply decline to do it. Go slack and go limp like a child who doesn't want to be made to do something. You ever have one of those kids, right? You, you ECEs will know, right? Like they just go, right? They're just a limp noodle. Yeah. Why do any of this? Why carry this cross? Why endure the humiliation and torture to simply meet the same fate as if you did not to meet death anyway? Nonviolent resistance forces the oppressor, in this case the Roman government, to either carry the cross for Jesus or kill him on the spot, ending the public spectacle before it could begin. And yet, Jesus willingly drags this cross through the streets 
falling under its weight three times, enduring the jeering from the crowd. And why? Why? Because Jesus knows that each step is a step closer to the end. And in the end, it is not defeat that awaits him, but victory. In the face of that victory, these moments of anguish may seem small experiences, minor stumbles to get something better, and that spurs him onward and inspires him to keep going. But it is not quite over yet. Victory is not quite yet realized at this moment in history. The humiliation continues as Jesus is stripped of all that he has left. The Romans finally succumb to the crowd and they take his robe. The mockery and the insults continue to fly, demanding he perform a miracle to save himself, trying to goad God into proving something in this very moment. The parable of the lost son is a very commonly used parable for many things. In fact, I've preached on a number of its lessons from time to time and have a few coming up in the years ahead. Most often we hear it used as a story of unhindered love, and you may have heard that this morning as I said it from Scripture. The younger son thinks he knows better than Father Dearest and leaves home with his cut of the inheritance. He treats his father as if he'd already died, taking his share and storming off into town to make his mark on the world. Come to find out the world is savage and difficult. The younger son loses it all and ends up sleeping with the pigs. He finally comes to terms with his folly after realizing that even his father's servants get better off than what he's got now, and he returns home. His father runs out to greet him in the driveway, wrapping up uh, his younger son in a loving embrace, returning him to status once more. It's lovely, it's heartwarming, Or we hear the parable and focus on the elder brother and father as opposites of each other. Here the father is compared to God, ready and waiting to welcome home the wayward lost sheep. But our friends, our family, and even our sometimes our church family even, uh, come off as the elder brother, judgmental and harsh. The elder brother sees the transgression of his kin and pronounces judgment upon him, condemning him entirely. The unforgiveness welling up in the elder brother's heart is a cautionary tale for us, not to become so jaded that we lose the ability to see God's holiest of works right in front of us. Today, however, this beloved parable becomes an illustration of a different nature. During and throughout the year, we humans, we will ebb and flow in terms of our faith. It's true. Some days we have plenty and others we feel defeated. Some days we charge ahead thinking that we are ready with with or without God. And some days we fall behind. On this particular day in the life of our parable characters, the younger son is feeling all charged up. He's had enough of living under his father's rule. He feels he could do a better job of it. And he just needs this break and he's tired of waiting for it. I'm sure at least one of you here have had a day like that. I'll be the first to admit it. Been there, okay. You're waiting on this prayer to be answered, right? Or you're waiting for wisdom. You've discerned. You've got this great plan, and you just want to go, right? Impatience, we might label that. But it's a little bit more than that. We also think that we know better, that we don't need to wait for anyone else's blessing on this. So we start up that business. We quit our job. We invest our money, or we spend it in some other way. We charge ahead without God. And we slowly wind our way down the path. We take our inheritance and we go. And just like the younger son, we go and we go too far. And boy, do we find ourselves in a heap of trouble when we get to the end, don't we? Our passage from Joshua is just the opposite, however. The children of Israel are obediently following God. They go where he tells them, camp where he tells them, cross where he tells them. But it wasn't always so. They only got to this point of waiting on direction from God by first being the younger son from the parable. The children of Israel, under the direction of Moses, after being freed from Pharaoh, begin grumbling and griping against Moses and God. They begin to suggest that they would have a better off in Egypt, doing things their own way, which is to say that they wanted to still be enslaved. They begin to complain and moan about their conditions thinking that if they had just simply parted ways with Moses and God, they'd have been better off. They land themselves in a heap of trouble. 
Thinking that they'll do it their own way, they find themselves wandering the desert for a generation because of it. This is often the price we pay for being a younger son. For thinking that we can have it better or that we know better than God or our elders. We wind up in a cold city, the harshness of the world around us. We wind up losing everything to the God of this world, to Satan, just as the younger son did. We get swindled. And we can find ourselves in a sort of spiritual situation like this as well. It doesn't have to be material, as the parable makes it out to be. We can make a decision in a relationship. We can take on a new task at church. There's something new, right? We can take on something like that going on, right? And after weeks and months, we find ourselves joyless, bereft of success. There's no movement in the situation, no movement on the tasks we're wanting. It's like pushing a boulder uphill. Been there. I've taken on tasks at church before. After weeks of hard work, job doesn't pay off, right? People don't support it, no turnout. Materials get used up, something falls through, it happens. Maybe a spiritual practice gets railroaded, that's related to Lent. If you're struggling with a younger son's situation out there, then this parable is for you today. Lent is your time to return to your roots. Lent gets touted at this, as this time of great sacrifice, right? To, to walk in the same shoes as Jesus. In fact, this sermon series began that way as we examine each of the stations of the cross each week. We get a fuller picture of that road that Jesus walked on his way to his death. That resonates with us, reminding us of the suffering our Savior went through and causes us to have this deep contemplation on what that means to us. So Lent becomes synonymous with sacrifice. People give up chocolate, they give up internet, or some kind of vice that they have on their lives. Admirable, and certainly appropriate for sure. But I want to advocate a secondary course for those of us who maybe are going through a younger son moment in our lives. Perhaps, perhaps, Lent, for you, can become a moment where you give up being the younger son. Give up this path that you're on that you think you know better. That you want to take your inheritance and run off into the world. And instead, use this Lenten time to return home. To return to your father. Return to God. I invite you to follow the younger son's example still. When he sleeps with the pigs, he takes a long, hard look at his life. And he realizes that he's gone a little too far off the path. This really wasn't what he was intending to do. And he's hurt people to get here, including himself. We often do that when we storm off on our own, thinking that we know better or best. We may hurt people along the way, but we ultimately end up hurting ourselves. And we wind up in the pig pen, contemplating our decisions. The younger son, while not perfect and certainly still has much to learn, sets his own pride aside and decides to return home. So come home for Lent. March yourself back up the driveway to your Heavenly Father and begin the journey home this Lent. Give up thinking you know better or that you can do it without God. And then as Lent unfolds for you, let God wrap around you his cloak of mercy and love. Let him slip on the ring of forgiveness back on your finger and prepare you a feast because as the younger son is restored, so Lent can restore you. Lent can be your moment of turning around and saying to God, I've been wrong. I'm sorry. Amen. You are all ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through you. Let all you do be done in love. Amen.
you purchase us at such a cost. And all the world adores and count the sauce. Bear the cross. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. 